back when my son, Riley, was around seven or eight, my wife and I noticed something peculiar about him. He had a, a passion for drawing and coloring. He was actually very creative. He liked to draw the normal kid stuff, like pictures of us, our dog, and our two cats, and other animals. But what really caught our attention was that he kept drawing the same house over and over again. At first, we thought he had simply discovered a subject he liked, and enjoyed drawing it. He'd drawn houses before, but they were pretty simple, the kind that you would normally see a kid draw. But this specific house was drawn differently than normal, and was a lot more detailed. I could tell it was the same house because of those details and the colors that he used. Over time, he would add in more features of this same house and would draw it from different angles as well. He added the square shingles on the roof, the shutters on the window, the flower bed in the yard. Everything was there and precise. Now, there was nothing wrong with these drawings, and none of it ever looked alarming or out of the ordinary, so we never questioned it, or called it out other than saying that he was doing a great job. But we did become curious when he started drawing the house from the top, like a blueprint. Granted, he was only eight, so the lines weren't straight and there were no words or labels, but it was very clearly a blueprint. Granted, he was only eight, so the lines weren't straight and there were no words or labels, but it was very clearly a blueprint. That's when we started asking about what he was drawing. He kept saying that it was his house, which we thought was odd because it obviously looked nothing like our house. I tried asking more questions about what he meant, but his answers were typically short and vague. Again, it wasn't hurting anything, so I just let it go. During a school break, I stayed home with him a lot as I was a contractor and was in between jobs at the time. After lunch, he wanted to go play in his room and excused himself. I'd been lounging around the living room when I noticed it had been a few hours since I even saw or heard from him, so I thought I would go check in. He had the door open, and as I rounded the corner, I saw him with his Legos spread out on the floor, organized by color and piece, and some loose-leaf printer paper next to him with the drawings of the house again. I could tell by his mumblings and long sighs that he was getting frustrated, so I knocked on the door frame to let him know that I was there. He looked up at me with an almost sad or frustrated eyes. I asked him what he was building, and again he said, my house. I asked him what he meant by that, and he explained that it was his old house. Again, this is the only house he knows when it comes to places he's lived. He's been to my parents and my in-laws home before, but we've lived at this house since he was born. I think this frustration got the best of him, because he finally explained more. No, my house from a long time ago. I can't remember things about it. It's important, but I can't think about it as much anymore. It didn't really clear anything up, but I just assumed that he meant his drawings. He was still young, so his sentences weren't perfect, but I feel like he got the point across. I just told him that he was doing great and to keep it up and I was confident that he would make it perfect, just the way that he wanted. But Riley just shook his head, his expression still serious. No, Dad, you don't get it. It's not made up. It's my old house. I built it. I lived there. His sentence slowly tapering off as the look on his face dropped to a frown. I was taken aback. Yes, he was a very creative kid, and... I'd say even imaginative, but he's never been this passionate about it when me or his mom approached him while playing. I didn't know what to think about this. We hadn't watched anything about an old house, or building them for that matter, so where could this be coming from? 
it was hard for me to wrap my head around what could be troubling my young son, but I was still curious to learn more. I asked him what he could remember about this old house. Riley took a deep breath. I could tell his eyes were filled with sadness, and he said, I remember making the house with my own hands. Looking down at his hands with his palms out, he continued, I was happy about it. I did a good job. I lived there with my girlfriend, and there was a baby. But one day there was a cracking sound and the floor broke upstairs. It crushed us, and I couldn't save us. I was very scared. And now I remember it again, and I don't want to forget it, because I need to figure out how I messed it up, so that it doesn't happen at our new home. I don't want to die again. I don't want you to die. My heart broke as I listened to him recall what I could only describe as a past life. I started trying to think of literally anything he could have watched or seen, or maybe something he heard his mom and I talk about, but I couldn't recall anything. I don't even remember hearing about a house collapsing on the news or on the radio. And when I asked him if this was a dream, he told me no, because he saw these thoughts all the time when he was awake, not asleep. At that moment, and even though it was the voice of my little boy, those weren't his words. I could tell. My initial skepticism was overruled by the overwhelming sense of compassion and wonder. I wanted to figure this out to not only make sure this never troubled my son again, but to make sure if this was legitimate, that the person he was could move on and be at peace. After telling my wife about what I experienced, she was skeptical at first too, but after hearing it come directly from Riley, she seemed a bit more convinced that something was definitely off here. Over the following weeks, Riley continued to share more details about his memories. He described the layout of the house, the creaky floorboards, and even the scent of the baked goods that his wife would always make. He even described the flowers that his wife had planted outside the house, white tulips. But he would always bring it back around, saying that he needed to make sure this place was stronger, and making sure history didn't repeat itself. I thought the best thing to do would be first to assure Riley that our current house was safe. I did everything I could to get diagrams, blueprints, and structural layouts of our home. I contacted our realtor, I tried government records, and I even brought in an appraiser. With all the info I got, I was able to piece a lot of it together, and I showed it to Riley. He seemed to understand everything on paper better than I could. He explained where the stress points were in our place, and walked through it, trying to determine where the internal beams or walls were. But when we finished the walkthrough, he said that it made him feel much better, and it helped him understand what he did wrong. He said he was no longer scared of our new home. I just remember the huge hug that he gave me, thanking me for helping him that day, and I remember it being such an unusual hug. Again, it was my son, but the strength in this hug and the tears in his eyes made me think something there was not him. As time went on from there, he drew the house less and less, and rarely talked about it, until one day he just never mentioned it again. Riley is now about to start high school, and he said he doesn't remember any of this. Part of me is relieved because I only want him to remember a happy childhood, but I kind of also wanted to hear more about the house. I'm still curious about it myself, and I would love to find it, or at least some records on it since it might not be standing anymore. But the first problem is, I don't even know if it was in the same state we live in now. I guess that that will just always be an unanswered part of this story. In the end, it has definitely opened my mind to the world of past lives, 
and possibly reincarnations. This extraordinary experience has taught me that there is certainly more to this world than just life and death. This is a story that I've kept to myself for a very long time. Other than family, because they were involved and affected, the only other person that knows about this is a close friend. I still get this bizarre feeling recalling it, and I know that many people may not believe it, but I wanted to share it. However, just to give my family privacy, I will not be using real names, nor will I be sharing where I'm from. What now feels like a century ago, my family and I gathered at my grandparents' rustic summer home for a much-needed and long-planned family reunion. It was a picturesque cabin with a little guest house on the same property, both tucked away in the woods, surrounded by trees and a gorgeous lake. This home was built by my family, and the land had always been in our family. I knew that one day it would be passed down to me and my brother. At the time of this reunion, I had one child, a young daughter that I'll call Emily. Emily was about six at the time, but she had never been there before. She met my grandmother, her great-grandmother, but she always came to see us. I was excited to take her so that she could experience and share similar memories that I had made there. I wanted her to swing on the tire swing that my dad put up. I wanted to take her swimming and fishing in the lake. I wanted her to be able to get out of the busy city and experience the beauty that was nature. Our time there was perfect. Everybody wanted to meet Emily as many of them hadn't yet. And there were a few other kids close in age, so all the cousins and second cousins were able to play together. We were all having a great time. As the sun began to set and people were slowly trickling down, my daughter was in between being fully awake and in need of a nap. Emily and her great-grandmother always seemed very close. She loved being with her and doing everything that she did, so... I accepted when she wanted to go sit out back on the porch with her and swing, thinking that she would doze off too. I went inside and was talking to my mom and a few other relatives, nothing of importance really happening at this point. It had been no more than 15 minutes or so when I heard the back door open and my grandma come in. She was alone. I wasn't concerned because there was no one around but family. I knew that she would be fine out there. What I was concerned about was the distressed look on my grandma's face. I went to ask her what was wrong, and she asked to speak to my mom, her daughter, alone. I nodded, and the two of them walked off to her bedroom. I went out to check on Emily, who was still sitting in the swing and singing to herself. I asked if she was okay, and she said yes. And then she asked if Nana was okay. That's what she called her. I said that she was, and Emily said that she didn't mean to make her sad. I couldn't see how she could have, so I told her that she didn't, and I sat with her. Shortly after, my mom came outside and asked to speak with me. She asked me what Emily had said to Grandma, and even what I could have said to Emily about her. My mom had a suspicious yet worried tone to her voice, and I had no idea what was going on. First, my grandma was upset, still hiding in her bedroom, and then my mom, and all over what my six-year-old could have said. It didn't make any sense, and I demanded an explanation. So I went back to sit with Emily to try and figure out what was said. I asked her, and she looked down at her lap like she was sad or that she knew she was going to be in trouble. I tried my best to reassure her that she wasn't in trouble in any way, but I just wanted to know what they talked about. Little did I know that my daughter had actually set off a chain reaction of revelations 
that many of us in the family were unaware of. Emily, in her innocent yet perceptive way, had asked her Nana why she never visited her grave anymore. Startled by the question, my grandma inquired further. Emily pointed out into the trees behind the home that we were in, saying, Over there, I missed hearing you sing to me. But it's okay, I'm not sad. I'm happy now, and you should be happy now too. The impact of those words? Emily had no idea what she had done. Emily seemed to know about a long buried secret, one that I didn't even know about. My grandma had experienced a heartbreaking tragedy in her youth. She'd become pregnant before marriage, and her father found out. He went into a rage which led to a devastating outcome. The unborn child was lost, and my grandma had buried her in the trees, scared, not knowing what else to do. She would often go back there to talk to her and sing to her and would be out there for hours. For decades, she had carried this secret with her, weighed down by guilt and pain, but you would never guess it. My grandma was always the life of the party. She loved having people over and would do anything for you if you were in trouble. If people fought, she was always there to break it up and fix what was broken. It was almost unbelievable, and I wanted to go back and check in the trees to confirm this, but... My mom stopped me, telling me no. I remember her using the same parental tone from when I was a child, and that alone told me that this had to be true. She told me not to bring it up to Grandma and that she would figure it all out. However, Emily seemed to be able to tell that something was wrong, and she was adamant on seeing her Nana. After asking if she could go in, she allowed her in and the remaining few of us stayed outside, continuing to entertain ourselves. They both came out shortly after, my grandma's eyes slightly red from crying, but she was all smiles as she carried Emily. They both were. The rest of that night picked back up, and everyone, including my grandma, was lighthearted and laughing. Emily and I stayed in my grandma's spare bedroom that night, and my mom was staying in the guest house, so... We were all up pretty late talking, Emily long since asleep. My grandma apologized for the way that she'd acted earlier, but I kept telling her that it was okay and that she didn't need to talk about it if she didn't want to. I even apologized, unaware of how Emily would have any knowledge of that. I didn't even know about it. But I listened to her story, and I saw a part of my grandma that I never knew of. After she explained further, she mentioned how she always felt something different with Emily. I could agree with her. They always seemed extremely close from the moment that they met. Emily had a very bad illness shortly after being born. I was stressed out trying to calm her, but nothing worked. Even my mom tried to help with similar results, but when my grandma came over, she asked for Emily and... I teased that I would be surprised if she calmed down. To my surprise, she did. She calmed down near immediately, and I was shocked. It continued like this as Emily grew up, too. They were so close, and I never knew why. Not that it made a difference to me, it was just heartwarming to watch. My grandma explained how she always felt like Emily was her guardian angel on Earth and that her unborn child was part of Emily. Normally, I would have probably said that sounded insane and weird, but I could absolutely believe it. It's like Emily had known her a lot longer than six years, and how else would she have known about the grave in the woods? She didn't even understand death yet. No one had passed since I'd had her, so it was never something that she would have known about. After this event, my grandma and Emily seemed to have an even stronger, inseparable bond. She stayed over at our place often, and Emily always wanted her to stay in her room with her. I loved it. 
and I know that it meant so much to my grandma, too. It was like she got to live with her baby after all. My grandma passed away two years ago, and it was very hard on all of us, especially Emily. But after her service, Emily was the one to tell us that we needed to be happy, because she would never want us to be sad. Knowing the bond that they had together, I felt like it was my grandma herself telling us this. Emily is now 13, and she remembers her Nana vividly, and talks about her at times. However, she has no recollection of the conversation she had that night at the reunion. She remembered how close they were, but couldn't explain why. Even with my grandma now gone, my mom and I still talk about that night. Emily's innocent words had triggered a very powerful healing process, and I'm thankful that my grandma was able to pass on without any guilt or sadness in her heart. I don't know where this story fits, so I do apologize for not including a topic, but I know that you've done stories similar to this in the past, so I thought that you may like it. I don't think it's technically a glitch or anything like that, but it's something similar to some of those stories. Either way, I know you'll find a way to fit it somewhere. One point of note is that this story was told back to me, so sorry if my details are all over or a bit sparse. The story is about me from whenever I was three and four. There were several occurrences that happened, but I'm only going to write about the ones that really stood out to me and that make for the best stories. One of these was told to me by my grandmother and the other by my mother. The first of these two stories happened when I was three. Both of my parents had to work to make ends meet, so they always dropped me off at my grandmother's house in the morning, and I would spend most of the day with her. I loved going to my grandma's house most mornings, but according to them, on this particular day, I was in an absolutely awful mood. Like, to the point that I was mean and aggressive the whole time that I was getting up and getting ready. My mom tried to talk to me and ask me why I was so mad, and I just kept trying to say something, but every time I would, I would start bawling and she couldn't understand me. It got to the point where she was trying to hug me and tell me that it was going to be okay, but I kept pushing her and telling her that I didn't want a hug. She relented and just finished getting me ready. And when she got me to my grandma's house, she warned her that I was in a bad mood. But my grandma said that it was obvious because of how I was just scowling. My grandma said that the whole morning, I was just sitting there on the couch and watching the news, and that I was holding back crying for the longest time. After a while of this, my grandma came over and sat with me on the couch, and asked me why I was so upset. Apparently when she asked me, I was more willing to talk about it, and I told her that I knew about being born. She said that it didn't make sense, and she asked what I knew about being born. And I told her that I knew about before I was born and that being born hurts. She tried to press me a bit more on this, and I just kept saying that being born hurt and that I was scared. She assumed that this was just some weird little kid thing, and after a while, I didn't seem to want to talk about it. Later that day, I had apparently calmed down because I approached her, and I asked her if she knew about being born. She asked what I meant, and I asked her if she knew about how much it hurt to be born again. It was the again part that confused her, but she mentioned that she didn't know what it was like to be born because adults don't remember that far back. I looked her straight in the face and told her that I remembered it. And I then started telling her about how it was warm before I was born, that I was sleepy all the time, 
And then one day it all hurt, and I was born. Apparently I kind of freaked her out when I told her this, because this wasn't normal for a three-year-old to talk about. But she just kind of nodded along and asked me to tell her more. I just kept telling her the same thing about how much it hurt, and as I was explaining it, I kept starting to cry, but I would stop myself. She told my mom about this, and my mom had no idea where I got the idea from, so they just had to pretty much accept that I was a little weirdo talking about weird things. And that was that. I had apparently mentioned this once or twice more, but it wasn't until I was four that things got really weird. One day, I was home with my parents, and I had told my mom that I wanted to talk to her. She came into my bedroom and said that I looked really sad, and she asked me if I was okay. I told her that I wasn't okay, and she asked me what was wrong, and I then apparently just hit her with a, my life before was really sad. She laughed and told me that I didn't have a life before, that I've always been her son, and I came back with, no, I mean my life before I was your son, my life before I died. She was a bit shocked by this, again thinking that no four-year-old should be making these comments, but she wanted to see what I had to say. So, she asked me about my life before. I told her that, before I was born, before I was her son, I was an old man named John. I said that when I was John, I had hurt a lot of people, and that before I died, all I could do was cry because nobody loved me. I told her that I had a daughter that didn't love me, and that my wife didn't love me either, but that she had died first, so I was all alone when I stopped being John. I described John as being this angry and depressed old man that did nothing but sit and watch the TV, and that he was always angry at the world. And every night before he went to bed, he would ask God to fix it all, but he never did. I gave her a lot of detail about this seemingly fictional old man, to the point that she started to think about whether I had watched something or was told about him. She asked me where I had heard about John, and I told her that I didn't hear about him, that I was him. I said that before I was me, I was John, and that when I was John, I was always so sad. She told me that she got a bit curious about what I would say, so she asked me what happened to John, and I told her that my last day as John was painful. I told her that I woke up, and I went to get my coffee, and when I got to the kitchen, I felt a pain in my stomach and fell down. When I fell down, I couldn't get back up, and I just laid on the floor thinking about how nobody would ever save me. I told her that, while I was laying on the floor, I kept telling myself that I needed to get up, but I never did. And after a while, I started getting really tired. Then, after I got tired, I fell asleep, and I didn't wake up. At this point, she wasn't sure what to say because her four-year-old son had just told her this long, detailed story about an old man that was miserable at the end of his life, and apparently died on his kitchen floor. She gave me a big hug and told me that it was okay, that I wasn't John anymore. I told her that I knew I wasn't John because I was born again as me, and that I wouldn't do the same thing as John because I had learned my lesson. And that was pretty much the end of it. When I was that age, I apparently had these really vivid memories of before I was born, when I was born, and apparently remembered parts of my past life that I had. I don't remember any of this now. It was way too long ago, obviously, but my mom and grandma remember how emotional I was during all of this, and how I told them details that no young child should or would know. 
and they firmly believed that I was telling them about some sort of previous life that I had lived. My parents are big believers in the supernatural, so they've always believed me, even though I was seemingly just a kid rambling. I don't know what to think of it, but after hearing all the stories about the crazy things that happened in our reality, I have to say that I'm more of a believer than not, and part of me wishes that I could remember all of those old memories. If for nothing else, I would like to just know what it was that I saw in my mind as a little kid. After getting permission from my friend, I wanted to share this story with you and others that might find it interesting. And several years ago, my friend Elaine had an experience that left us all questioning the very fabric of reality. It all began when we went on a seemingly innocent road trip, and visited an old historical mansion that was turned into a small museum. The days leading up to this event were quite the normal vacationing fun, and nothing was askew, until we saw a pamphlet for this place. We've gone to plenty of art shows and museums before, but when Elaine saw this place, she said that she really wanted to make time to go there. She said that she couldn't explain why, but she knew that something would be there for us. I didn't see any reason not to go, and we adjusted our plans to make room for it. As soon as we arrived, Elaine explained that she had an inexplicable sense of deja vu. She said that this place looked very familiar to her, yet she's never been here. It was in a state that neither us nor her family have ever been to. We just chalked it up to just being that strange phenomenon and went inside. And shortly after, I could tell that something was going on in Elaine's head, but she was not outwardly expressing it. I stayed quiet as we went through the various rooms, looking at the antiquated tools and structures, as well as the art strewn across the walls. The further we went in, the more that I could see the unease in her. Then we reached a small room that contained a beautiful gown and a painting with a dim light hanging above it. The painting was of a young girl with striking green eyes, her dark hair pulled into an elegant bun with thin, soft curls framing her face. The woman was wearing the same gown that was hanging in that room. Elaine seemed to stop at the painting, staring at it intently. I looked over at it and saw that her eyes were watery, like she was holding back tears. Something about the painting seemed to pull at her heartstrings. I nudged her, looking back at the painting and asking her if she was okay. I know her. Like, I knew her and she knew me. Like, I was her. Knowing who we were, I just kind of chuckled and said, Oh yeah? She looked over at me and I could see her visibly swallowing hard. So I again asked her what was wrong. She said that she didn't know and we soon moved on, the rest of our tour being pretty silent. After we left, I tried to lighten the mood and said that the place was pretty interesting, and talked about some of the things that we saw. She seemed to try her best, but I could still feel something was there that she wasn't talking about. We went back to our hotel, where she talked about what she felt. She reiterated how she felt something telling her she needed to go when she saw the pamphlet, and the whole time that we were in the mansion... She felt like she had been there before. She was able to go through all the corridors and rooms smoothly because she just knew where each room was. Then we got to the picture. She talked about how she had a rush of emotion flow through her from happiness to confusion and sorrow, and it was all overwhelming. She explained how even though the painting said artist unknown, she knew who that was, and who painted it. She said the woman in the photo was named Arabella, and her father's friend painted it. Yes, she said her father. 
She said that she used to be Arabella. I didn't quite understand what she was saying at the time, but she briefly explained how she felt like her life as Elaine was a second life. I was confused, but also curious to hear more about her experience, but we stopped to have dinner and just enjoyed our night. The next day, Elaine woke up seemingly a bit sorrowful, but also enlightened, I suppose. She told me about a very vivid dream that she had and explained how it had been a recurring dream for her for as long as she could remember. They never made sense, as it seemed to jump around a lot, though. But that night, the dream made sense, and it was the clearest it had ever been for her. It was as though she was telling me a story. She explained that she was Arabella, and that she was laying in a large green field with a handsome young man sitting next to her. And then she could hear the booming voice of a man yelling out her name, Arabella. She recalled how scared she felt as the man she was with kissed her, and ran off, and then how she stood up to begin walking towards the voice that she had heard. And she said that the dream ended, or she may have woken up as she was running, so she didn't know what else happened. However, she now understood what was going on in the dream. She was Arabella. And even though his name was not mentioned in the dream, she knew the young man that she was with was named Felix, and he was her true love. She also knew that the person shouting for her was her father. That dream, and our visit, awoke something in her. It was no longer a this feels familiar, but a straight up I remember this former life. It was the 18th century. She explained how her family was very wealthy and had a high standard to live up to. Everything she wore, said, ate, and how she did it was all scrutinized. She was the youngest of three daughters, but she was also very different. She was bored with the life that they lived. She didn't want to sit in a room all day, watching dancers or play the piano. Everything she did was to prepare to be a good wife and secure her future with another wealthy man, so she didn't tarnish her family's name. The problem with that, though, was that she already had eyes for someone else. She was in love with Felix. His family owned a shoe repair store, and he was very creative with making musical instruments out of anything. She remembered being impressed and explained how he made a bell or chime for blades of grass and a few of her hairpins. She was infatuated with him, and she knew that she wanted to be with him for the rest of her life, but her parents wouldn't allow it because his family was far from the wealthy status that they required. She was told that she would marry a friend of her father's. She and Felix met in secret to enjoy each other's company, and try to plot out how to run away together. But the part in the dream was the last time she would ever see Felix. Her father caught them after warning him multiple times, and she was forced to stay inside after that until she was married off. The painting was done by her arranged husband a day after their wedding. As Elaine recounted these details to me, I watched her smile and become red in the face as she talked about Felix, how dull she looked talking about her daily life, and then the tears began when she talked about her wedding and posing for the painting. You could see the pain in her eyes. I was at a loss for words watching her explain all this. She never really had an interest in that kind of thing, so I doubted that she had just randomly read a history book or researched this, planning this whole scenario out. But if none of that happened, then what other explanation is there? After we finished, I told her that we needed to keep track of all this and to look into it further, when we returned home in a few days. She assured me that she could never forget it again. Fast forward to when we did return home, this had definitely piqued my interest, so 
I wanted to look further into it. We went to the library and looked through old archives, and we even went through some shady third-party site similar to Ancestry to find more about Arabella. The surface info we found about her and her family was damn near identical from what she told me. We located her old family mansion, we found pictures of them all with names underneath, one of which said Arabella. Before we looked into the mansion more, Elaine was able to accurately describe the layout of the house. She could even describe the hidden pantries, the color of the drapes that hung in the window, and even described how there was always a faint scent of rose that lingered in the halls, due to the oils and cleaners their housekeepers used. Granted, that wasn't found online, but all the details that she gave, even things like how the place smelled, just flowed out of her, like she was giving a tour right there, and the physical details were eerily accurate. Again, Arabella's home was in a state that she had never been to as Elaine, so we couldn't find any other explanation other than she had to have lived a past life. The only disappointing part was that we didn't find much information on Felix. We found an old shoe business and the last name of the family, which Elaine remembered, but there were no real records following them. We couldn't find anything about their lives, nor obituaries. I think that kind of cemented the idea for us that he was not one of the popular and wealthy families, so there just wasn't much on them but we could at least confirm that they were real. Since this revelation, Elaine has really embraced her past life. She enjoys talking about it with others, and has even started drawing a lot more. She's an amazing artist, with anything from oils, charcoals, or even just pencil and paper. And seeing her draw these gorgeous old dresses and homes, with statues strewn about the yard... It's obvious where her inspiration is coming from. I always thought the idea of reincarnation was an interesting subject, but nothing ever swayed me in one way or another. Until this event. Now, I can say that I, without a doubt, believe that it is absolutely possible. So that, my friends, was a collection of some incredibly chilling past life stories. These stories are always typically incredibly emotional, but in my opinion, chilling is just the best word to describe them. They're not scary, per se. They're just stories that you hear, or I guess in my position, read. Um, they just... I don't know, skin crawling is the wrong word, but like it makes your hair stand up on end. Is that the is that is that the best way to put it? I don't know. I, I'm not really good at synonyms, I guess. I typically am, but right now I'm just like, it's a chilling story. Ooh, cold, I guess. I'm weird. Um Yeah. Just some really chilling true past life stories. Stories that I hope you, my friends, enjoyed. Uh I know that I did. Yeah. If you did enjoy them, you can hit that thumbs up button on the video that helps the video get pushed further into the system. If you're new to the channel and liked what you heard, you can consider subscribing to my channel as that helps my channel get pushed harder into the system. And if you really liked what you heard, you can help even further by leaving a comment, letting me know your thoughts. How you doing? How's it going? How's your weekend so far? Hopefully good. Yeah. There are other things you can do, like joining the Patreon or memberships, or super thanks. Uh, Patreon and memberships get early access to content like this, and other stuff depending on what you sign up for, and all that fun, just, stuff. I almost said jazz. I haven't spoken about jazz in a while with you guys, so it's probably about time. Do you like jazz? Anyways. I hope you are having a beautiful weekend, and I hope I do see you again here very soon. But until then, remember, you are loved, you are valid, you are important, you're the best you that you can be. Don't forget it, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And, until next time, my friends, much love, and sleep well.